turn, if you will, to that reading we had from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now we know that not long after the gospel was being preached by the apostles, as they spread the gospel around the uh, Mediterranean region, that false teachers sprung up, people who were denying the truth as it is in Christ. And though, of course, false teaching is poisonous and uh, can cause problems, it's wonderful really how God, in many ways, even in his sovereignty, used this. Because as a result, the apostles were caused to write that which would counter the false teaching and support the Christians in their own Christian walk. And so we have these letters which give us these wonderful descriptions of the glorious truths that are found in Christ as they're explained to us. And we have this glorious truth of the resurrection, the resurrection of the body. Now, <clears throat> Greek thought, which very much influenced the church at Corinth, had this idea that really after death, all you sort of became was a sort of fluttering, nondescript spirit. How contrary that is to the truth. Paul has been using various arguments in this chapter we're looking at to show the truth of the resurrection. And he says, what is at the heart of the gospel? What is at the heart of the message that we proclaim to men and women who are in their sins and perishing? Well, it is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without that, we've got no message. Because the resurrection tells us, you see, that his work is successful, it's complete. He died on behalf of sinners and God has accepted that work. He has triumphed. Nothing has been left undone that needed to be done and he's risen from the dead to show the greatness of his victory and God's approval of all that his son has done. And yet it's clear that there were those in Corinth who were scoffing at this thought of the bodily resurrection of the believer. And they were saying things like this, you know, when we die, when we die, our bodies, they, they decay or they're burnt or they're lost at sea and they dissolve in the waters. How can it be that they can ever be raised again? How can men and women possibly rise when their body is completely disintegrated? What form would the resurrection body take? These are questions that folks sometimes can raise today. And in some ways, you see, it's such an amazing thing, isn't it? Uh, the resurrection of the body, when we think about it, uh, perhaps we can think, well, what would it be like to be raised, having been buried, having died, to be raised on that day? Paul's aim is to really, in this passage we're going to look at, we're going to look at the passage that we read, he's really wanting to answer two questions. And the first question really is this. In the light of what has happened to the bodies of the dead, how is it that the bodies of believers, dead believers, can be raised up? And his second question is, what will the body be like? That body that we're given on the last day. And then he actually goes on and he answers a third question. And then he applies it. So we're going to follow Paul's way of dealing with these questions here. It's not that we're having a message on the resurrection a week early. Uh, it's uh, the fact we're still following the series in the great works of God. The great works of God. And it, we've got to the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. What power God will show. What a great work it will be when he raises his people from the dead. And so we've got four points tonight. The great works of God, the resurrection of the dead. Our first point is, how can the dead be raised? Secondly, with what body will they come? Thirdly, what will happen to those who are still living when Christ comes? And fourthly, what our response should be? So really, we're just following the way that Paul outlines his arguments, his uh, passage here in the Word of God. Firstly, how can the dead be raised? Paul, how can something which has been burnt, perhaps to death, and becomes gas and ash, or decays, how can that be raised back to life? 
Are you saying, Paul, that from dust and nothingness a body can be made? Yes, says Paul. Verse 35, but someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? Foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. Paul says, don't you look at, if you look at nature, you'll see there are these things which they must suffer corruption. They must go into the ground. They must decay before they can produce something far more, more wonderful. Seeds. Aren't seeds wonderful things? Seeds are amazing, aren't they? Trying to get some lupins going at the minute and some sweet peas. First lot of sweet peas I haven't really got going, so soaking some in water, hoping to get them going. Poppy seeds. Oh, tiny little thing. You can eat them, can't you, on bread. They scatter them on bread. You can eat poppy seeds. And that tiny little thing, it's this sort of speck. And yet it produces this great flower and this wonderful colours. Amazing, isn't it? You plant it and it decays and yet it becomes something glorious. And what the thing is, the seed, in no way compares to the glorious thing it becomes. That tiny little speck becomes this great plant with all these leaves that are doing all they need to do to photosynthesize and these wonderful flowers that open and all the insects go in. It's incredible. The seed in no way compares to what it produces. So says Paul, it's like the resurrection. Something dies and goes into the ground and it, it suffers corruption. And it, it doesn't compare really to what it will become in the end. And remember also, you see, says Paul, all flesh is not the same flesh, verse 39, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish and another of birds. There's a difference in the flesh that we see in the world around us. There's this tremendous difference in forms. There's this variation, even in the quality of the flesh we see here. So why should we think that our bodies should always be limited to their current existence? As they are now, when even in this life, God is able to give all these different things, all these varying forms that we see around us. Can I just mention the uh, butterfly at this point? The butterfly. If you ever see a caterpillar, you know, it's a sort of grub, little grub that's moving along. A caterpillar, we know what a caterpillar is. You know, if you get one on you, sort of, what's that? It's sort of strange thing going along, you, uh, along your finger. You compare that with the butterfly. It's incredible, isn't it? This sort of green, slimy thing compared to this beautiful butterfly. What has to happen to get from there to there? Well, it has to go into this chrysalis stage where it sort of eventually decides it's going to hang off a branch or something like that, and it sort of turns into this hard uh, sort of uh, shell. And then within that shell, it dissolves. It completely dissolves. And then all the proteins and the things are all rearranged. Now pops this, this wonderful butterfly. And, you know, the butterfly has got a proboscis, so it's just the right length to go down into the flower to get the nectar. It's got antennae, I think, and uh, it's got these beautiful wings, beautiful colours, and the colours aren't made by uh, dyes, they're made by interference effects. So certain cells have to be certain layers of thickness to give the sort of interaction so that the colours reflect in a certain way. It's incredible. From that grub to that through this phase where it turns into liquid. Now that can't happen by trial and error. It was no good one grub saying one day, oh, I'll try and become a butterfly and let's see what happens and I'll somehow become a chrysalis and I'll try and rearrange myself. Can't happen by trial and error. It must have been something that was made complete and perfect as it is. It's one of many thousands of things which show us that evolution is a farce. Evolution is nonsense. These things are created by this God who's able to take something like that and make it into something beautiful. The power of God, even in a butterfly, is declared to us. Anyway, I've got away from the beaten track there, but uh, it's wonderful, wonderful, these things. There are differences, says Paul, in the world of cosmology. 
celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. He says, verse 40, he says, there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. We can see that God has ordered it, that there are differences in glory, even in the heavenly bodies, this tremendous variation. And so, Paul says, verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection shouldn't, shouldn't seem fantastic, says Paul. Because, you know, the fact that there's this marvel of things going into the ground and dying and then becoming something completely, vastly different to what they were. There's this variation in the things that we see around us, even in the flesh that we see around us. Compare an ant to a man. Ants are amazing things. What ants can do, you know, that brain that's smaller than a pinhead, and yet they're so wonderful the way they work together. And yet, you know, an ant can't sort of lob a ball and can't sort of run 100 metres. Well, perhaps it can run 100 metres, but I think a man will beat it. So there's tremendous variation. Why can't there be variation in the way that God deals with his created order? Should we think it fantastic that the God who has made all these things and shows us all these varying degrees of complexity isn't able to take something weak like a human body that declines and goes into the ground and yet make something glorious out of it? It's nothing for God by his power. So Paul is answering the question, how can the dead be raised? It will all be done by the power of God, this glorious God who's made the world around us and shows us all these things which are wonderful, that it's got such design and such wisdom, and the God who is able to yet take a seed and let it decay and die, and it seems as nothing, and yet create this glorious thing that comes out of it, a great oak tree out of a little tiny acorn. This is the God who can do this. What he can do in nature, he can do by way of the resurrection. But the second question Paul answers here is this. Well, if there is to be a resurrection... With what body will it be that we come when we are raised from the dead? How different will it be to the body we have now? Well, verse 42, he says, The body that is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. That body goes into the ground and it's been a victim of the forces of the curse and of death and of corruption. The cells of that person have died. They've been subject to death. Well, says Paul, on that day when they're raised with Christ, they're raised incorruptible. They're raised free from any incorruption, any power of death or decay. And there's a completeness, there's a perfection, there's a vigour, there's a vitality which will never be undermined by the curse or by decay or by death. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. Man is brought down to death. What humiliation there is in death, what devastation the curse has brought upon us. You know, we originally, we were made to live forever. Originally, that's how it would have been. And yet we find we age, we decline, our sight gets poor, our hearing starts to go, our memory starts to get poorer. That glory is lost. And yet, wonderfully, it is sown in dishonour. It goes into the grave. And yet it's raised in glory. Our bodies then will be raised. They'll be like Christ's. We shall be like him. The burden, the debilitation of the curse will be gone. We'll have that brightness, that beauty, that glory that will never be lost in those resurrection bodies. Verse 43 again, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. How frail we get, how weak we get as we go on into old age, don't we? We have eyes that see and yet do not see. Uh, we have ears that hear and yet then don't hear. Legs and arms that were strong and firm, then they're weak and they're poor. But then... It is raised in power. We will have eyes that will never tire, ears that 
will always hear, bodies whose strength will never be diminished by pain or by disease. There won't be glasses in heaven, won't be pacemakers in heaven, won't be false teeth in heaven, false knees, false hips, all gone. This glorious body which God will give to us. Verse 44, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. It's an amazing thing with Christ. They could touch him, he could eat, yet he could pass through walls. There was somehow this ability. He was in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual. That's how it will be. Our bodies will have a spiritual power and quality to them. It'll be a body which can move and present itself in the spiritual dimension as well as in the physical. Do you know, it would have been enough, wouldn't it? If God had just given us our old bodies back, if he'd given us our old bodies back when we were about, what, 30, 35, something like that? If he'd given us our old bodies back then, uh, free from sin and the curse and corruption, if he'd just done that, that would have been enough. But no, he'll give us this more glorious resurrection body that's made like Christ's. One which can enable us to enjoy God in all his fullness. Our marvellous resurrection bodies. Verse 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. You see, Adam, as head of the physical race, has given life to all his offspring. So Christ, who is the last Adam, as head of his people, he gives them spiritual life. He gives them this spiritual life. Adam's descendants are related to him genetically. Christ's descendants are related to him by faith. Where it says there that Christ has become the life-giving spirit, doesn't mean to say that he's, he's confusing him with the Holy Spirit. But Paul means that Christ is a spiritual being and head who will give a greater and more wonderful resurrection life than Adam ever could. He gives life in a new dimension and in a new way. Verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spiritual. There's an order. We've got to have this physical existence before we can enjoy this greater spiritual existence. Yet, yet nonetheless, this great change will occur. Verse 47, the first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord of heaven. The first Adam owes his existence to God, the first Adam, but the last Adam owes his existence to no one but himself. He is the Lord from heaven. Verse 48, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. We bear Adam's constitution here. We're made like our first father. And we share his destiny to die and return to the dust. And yet if we know the new birth here in this life, if we know Christ, we'll know and share his image and his likeness. We'll be made like him. It's astounding, isn't it? When we read this, astounding what we read God is going to do for his people to raise us from the dead, to make us like Christ, to make us in the way that is described here. It's astounding. And yet it is true. It is true. And you know, every believer knows that it's true. Why? John 6, 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day day it's because you see we've already been raised if you're a believer you've already been raised you've already known the resurrection of power of Christ in your life because he's made you what you would never be left to yourself he's changed you he's come into your life he's given you life when you were dead in trespasses and sins how do we explain what we are why is it that we know Christ, we know God, we, we love Christ, we love the Word of God. It's not because we're trying to sort of convince ourselves or somehow work our way into God's good books or try and sort of just keep up a religion. It's because we've come to know the power of God in our lives. It's changed us. It's brought us to God. It's given us peace with God. The resurrection power of God has worked in our hearts. We, if you like, have known this first resurrection, this spiritual resurrection. 
And so we know there will be the greater resurrection that will come in God's good time. But then Paul anticipates another question. Thirdly, what happens to those who are living? What about those who've not died, who've not gone into the grave, who are still living when Christ comes again, appears on the clouds of heaven? There are those who won't go through the process of death. They won't be like those seeds that fall into the ground and suffer corruption. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Paul is saying this. As flesh and blood in our fallen human natures, we cannot just walk into heaven and live in heaven as, as we are. So what's got to happen? Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Paul speaks about this mystery, something which has always been true, but now has been fully revealed by his preaching. What is it? We shall not all sleep. This really means there that we shall not all die and close our eyes in death. There are some who shall be changed. How long will that change take? In a moment, verse 52. In an atomos, an atomos, the smallest instant of time, in the twinkling of an eye, with a wink of an eye, there'll be this change. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This trumpet will announce this great change. It won't be a secret thing, you see, this change. All will hear it. It will be a day of rejoicing, a day of triumph for the people of God. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality. It must happen. It must this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. It will happen. It is God's determined purpose. It is God's will for his people who know the Lord Jesus Christ that they will be raised and those who are living will be changed to be made like Christ also. What will happen when this great and glorious change will, will come has come? Verse 54, so then when this corrupt corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory death will be swallowed up by the victory of Christ everything that God has planned and announced will happen the complete destruction of death this great enemy Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? On that day, people say, well, where is the power of death now? Where is the power of death? It's lost all its power, and the grave has lost its power. They have no victory. It's been taken from them, the victory they thought they once had. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Death, you see, gets its power from sin. It's sin that produces death. Death is not really a physical problem, it's a moral problem. It's because we're sinners that we die. Where does sin get its strength from? It gets it from the law, our breaking of God's law. God says, do this. And, and we don't do it. We can't do it. We don't want to do it. And this victory we have is given to us. We don't earn it. It's one that only Christ can give to us. It's all through the work of Jesus Christ. So Paul shows us the fact of the reality of the resurrection of the body, this great work of God whereby we shall be raised to be made like Christ. He explains to us what that body is going to be like. Not some sort of ethereal spirit drifting around for eternity. No, body and soul made like Christ, incorruptible, a body of power. He shows what will happen to those who are still living. They'll be changed also to be made in the same way. 
Well, fourthly, Paul doesn't just leave us there. He then applies it. Fourthly, what our response should be. What our response should be to this teaching. Well, you know, if you're a child of God, this is your certain destiny. This is the destiny that lies before you if you're a child of God. The God who cannot lie, the God who's given his word, which has proven true over and over and over again, assures us that on that day he will raise us and he will make us all new. Not as we were, but far, far, far more glorious. We can have no idea of the exhilarating sense of well-being and joy that will flow through our veins, our nerves and minds because our souls are perfect, our bodies are perfect, we've been made glorious and we're in the perfect realm with the perfect one, the Lord Jesus. Do you know angels cause men to tremble? when they appear to them, because they're such glorious beings. Yet, you know, our glory will exceed theirs. It will exceed theirs. We'll be made more glorious than the angels. He will make the feeblest and filthiest of us a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating with this energy, this joy, this wisdom, and this love. We're going to need changed bodies to cope with dwelling in that realm of such joy and such love, being with God, being in the place where only that which is holy can enter in. What should our response be to these things? We should marvel. This is our destiny. This is our destiny. We bless God. We thank him. Oh, you see, it starts to put everything in perspective now. We start to understand more Why it is that we should have hope even in the deepest of trials and the greatest of difficulties. The suffering of the present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The compensation we will know when we are made like Christ. So we look at our sufferings here as a light thing. That light affliction is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Starts to put things in perspective when we appreciate what we're going to receive, what our destiny will be. Starts to make us realise how really what we go through in this life is, in many ways, though it's not hard, it's not easy, but in many ways it's, it's a small thing compared to what God will yet compensate us with and reward us with. But nonetheless, this certain destiny that we have should affect our lives now. How should it affect us, Paul? How should it affect our lives? This certain destiny, which is ours, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Is a bride to be. She's going to marry She's going to leave home to go to be and live with her husband. As she's preparing for a marriage, she doesn't think, well, you know, what colour would I like the bedroom to be that I'm soon to vacate? She's not worried about that, is she? She's leaving it all behind. She's looking to go somewhere else. She now lives and acts with a view to her future. So so should we. We're going to stand with Christ as the most glorious, most exalted being, righteous like him, utterly triumphant over death, over sin and hell. If that's the case, whatever we do here must be done with that certainty and that thought in mind as to where we're going and as to what we will be. One day I shall share this glorious destiny with Christ. What is consistent with that day? What will remain is only that which is consistent with that day, really. And I should be going after those things. I should be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing my labour is not in vain in the Lord. Don't follow the world. Don't follow the passing 
ways of this world, be steadfast. Don't go after what the world sets its heart on. Do not allow this truth to be denied or forgotten. Be immovable. Don't budge from walking in the way of the Lord and doing the will of the Lord. Don't let, allow the prospect of the resurrection to be removed from your mind. Let it, let it colour and influence all that you do and all your attitudes. And do the work of the Lord with all your heart. Be committed to your labours for the Lord. Never be taken away from serving the Lord and seeking to encourage and labour for his kingdom. We can get sidetracked sometimes, can't we? You can forget what our calling is and where our energies and our concerns, our first concern should be. With such a saviour, with such a reward which is ours, with such a certainty that is ours, are you doing what you should be doing for the Lord? Are you living as you should be living for the Lord? We can be self-centred, can't we? I want to do what I want to do. Self-indulgent is the spirit of the age. Do we realise the great debt we owe to God? Do we realise what our reward is, what our prospect is, how we're going to stand with Christ, how we're going to be made on that day? Do you know we'll give an account on that day? Will we say, Lord, forgive me? Lord, why ever did I go after that? Lord, why ever was I so slow and uncommitted to the cause of God? Lord, why wasn't I more aflame for God? Why was I so unwilling to do what I could have done? Why was it that sometimes I went to that work so rather sort of stingily? Not giving myself to it as I should. We'll stand there, we'll be amazed at how God has made us. We'll be overwhelmed with gratitude, praise and love. Maybe those therefore who know what it is to give ourselves completely, to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labour is not in vain in the Lord. Do you want to know this life on that day? Do you want to be made like Christ on that day, to be raised with Christ, to be with him forever in glory? Well, if you're going to know that resurrection then, you must know a spiritual resurrection now. You must be changed. You must be converted. You must truly come to know God. Ask God to save you. Ask him to change you. Do you know, he's willing. He's willing to save those who will call upon him. He's so kind. He's such a kind God. He's such a gracious God. He sent his son into the world to do everything. He was willing to strike his son, to curse his son, punish his son. Such is his kindness to sinners. Such is his desire that we would come and know this eternal life. He'll hear the cry of the humble. If we humble ourselves, if we acknowledge that we're sinners, we cannot save ourselves, we put away our pride, we're willing to look to Christ, we're willing to say, Lord, save me, I'm willing to follow you, I give my life to you. Do you know he's willing to save such as will do that? Because be warned, you see, in the book of Daniel, it says there, some will be raised to everlasting life. Some will be raised to everlasting shame and contempt. My friend, if you are to know eternal life, you must know the life of God now. You must know what it is to be converted now. You must know what it is to be one who has come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour. And if we know this, may it amaze us, may it cause us to marvel, may we find the light of this, the prospect of this, motivates us, moves us, invigorates us. So much we say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Lord, give me the work that you would have me to do. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord.